Uh, we've got a wonderful keynote speaker this morning, uh, Ms. Uh, Pam Melroy. Uh, Pam is uh, currently a director of Nova Systems, an Australian company, but actually she's got a very distinguished background. She's a former NASA astronaut and also a director, executive director at DARPA and really managed some significant programs. She's here in Australia uh, doing some work and helping us shape our Australian Space Agency. Uh, a really great person to have here, particularly as we are moving into the, let's say, the Space Age or back into the Space Age for Australia. Um, and I'm really excited to hear from you, Pam, this morning. And I'd welcome you up, so we'll get you going. I might have to slip out to go and greet the Minister, but uh, otherwise, uh, welcome. Please welcome. Pam Melroy. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here. Um, got lots of friends uh, here at DST and really enjoyed um, when I was at DARPA having engagement with the folks in the embassy. And um, it's, you know, to me, uh, some of the best time of my life. Uh, loved being an astronaut, but uh, being a part of uh, technology is really something that uh, excites me tremendously, and uh, so I'm really happy to be here. Today I am going to, see if I can get this, talk about defense innovation in a fast-paced world. So one of the um, things that annoys me is when people say that the government can't innovate. That is absolutely not true. So I was a test pilot on the initial program of the C-17, and uh, as I think you know very well, there's some really incredible technology. Uh, it was amazing to be a part of that. There were a lot of firsts. Uh, it still is a very unique aircraft. Uh, blown flaps, um, a lot of the pioneering use of materials. Um, and then, of course, all you have to do is look at this picture of the Joint Strike Fighter. What an incredible vehicle, right? There's nothing like it in the world. The capability that we have uh, built into that is quite extraordinary. And it's exciting that both of these uh, innovative weapon systems are being shared with Australia. Um, going back to uh, DARPA, um, this is actually the original logical map for ARPANET, ARPA uh, predecessor to DARPA. Um, did a lot of the initial work around the formation of the internet. And when I was a grad student at MIT, I logged on to ARPANET and I could see everyone else that was logged on at the same time. There were about 200 people around the country. And uh, I have to tell you, there were a lot of people at that time who said, I don't get it. What can you get out of having computers talking to each other, right? So uh, and that's why I included the picture on the right of a, of a smartphone, because a lot of the things in your smartphone also came out of other DARPA technologies that now, of course, have leapfrogged across, and um, the internet has had a massive impact on our lives. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But it is important to know, um, I put the date there for a reason. So that original tech investment was made quite a long time ago. One of the other aspects of government innovation is that it's often very low production rate <laughs> by comparison to the rest of the world. And uh, had to slip in one picture here of the space shuttle and the International Space Station, which I was honored to be a part of the development for. Uh, all three of my missions to the space station were to attach new pieces. And uh, if you think it's challenging to build a vehicle here on the ground, Try doing it in space one bit at a time. You have to completely reboot the software uh, and update it. Uh, it's actually a miracle in a lot of ways, but now, of course, we're doing science 24-7 aboard the International Space Station. And so it's an ongoing innovation platform that continues to give. But things are changing. So according to an IBM study, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are generated every day on the internet. And there's some numbers to suggest that that number is going up. I've heard various numbers quoted about all the knowledge generation in the, in the world. Uh, we are going to uh, be doubling it within a couple of years. So what does that mean? The availability of this information worldwide has allowed people to share information and more rapidly innovate. But even more importantly, it used to be that if you could sell something to the government, you might sell 10,000 units and you were made. Well, now we're operating in a global market. 10,000 units of anything is totally a niche market, right? So what's really changed 
on top of that is that the government is no longer the major driver of R&D in the United States. And I'm going to show you this chart that NSF put together. It's important to know that the end, chart, uh, end date of this chart is 2007, but in fact the numbers have steadily climbed. And what it's really telling you is that the U.S. government is not the primary source of R&D dollars in the United States. And okay, so what? Doesn't matter. We're here. We still have a mission. We who do defense technology for national security, we can continue to do the things that we need to do. Maybe we're a little slower. Maybe there's stuff going on in the commercial market. Who cares? Well, there's a reason why we should care. And that's because there are growing threats to national security from this technology proliferation. This is a specific example. Recently, the uh, Venezuelan President Maduro uh, was threatened by a lightweight commercial UAV with a bomb attached to it. Uh, quite a shocking moment. Of course, it was not a successful event. Uh, on the other hand, it really, I think, um, uh, was, was quite shocking for everyone probably would not be shocking for our war fighters uh, who are out in the field in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, because the bad guys have been doing stuff like this for a couple of years now. So this is an extremely fast-paced threat, and there are others. So the proliferation of hypersonics uh, capability through investment and uh, stealing of technology, uh, ballistic missiles, uh, as we know from the North Korea threat, cyber and space. They're all areas where there are rapid changes occurring around the world. So the problem with that is our adversaries don't worry about IP. They don't worry about contracting. They don't worry about stakeholder requirements. They want to get something out in the field quickly at low cost. And they're willing to accept that the first attempt might be a failure, but the second and third might be successful. And that is a completely different attitude than we take in government innovation. They're inside our innovation loop. And they're playing off our weakness and their strength. So how do we address this? What are we going to have to do to try to change? So let's start with commercial partnerships. One of the very important aspects of, of DARPA is in the last 10 years really thinking carefully about the partnerships that we have with commercial industry and taking a look at what's available commercially and then adding our secret sauce on top for national security. So it's a much quicker way to get uh, uh, things into the hands of the warfighter. And I have to say this, intellectual property cannot be a barrier. Industry will tell you it is the number one barrier to working with the government. They worry about IP. That's how they make their money. Now, I'm not going to say that we should sell the farm on IP every single time. There are times when the government must maintain the IP. There is no question about that. But there has to be a very thoughtful approach. One interesting point that we often made at DARPA is that sometimes the tech needed to be put into the field because it was going to be obsolete anyway in five to 10 years. And so maybe the answer is, that you only need limited government rights for a period of time and then allow the company to continue to iterate and find other markets. Focusing on transition is very important. And, and that was the holy grail uh, at DARPA. Who used the technology you developed? If you had an eye-popping demonstration, that used to be enough. And that's not enough anymore. We need to actually show value for the work that we're doing. We have to get that tech into the warfighter's hands. The key aspect of that is treating the entire team, starting with the warfighter, including acquisition, the technical expert, and the industry partner. All four of those elements of the team have to be on the same page. They have to be very clear. They each have to have uh, the proper incentives for behavior, but also they just need to see themselves as a part of a team. And that's how you break down the barriers and move faster. So, what does that mean for the role of a government tech expert? So I always told my program managers they needed to be a sophisticated consumer of commercial products and capabilities. What does that mean? It means that you need to know what's going on and what's commercially available in industry. You need to know what's coming down the pike 
from an academic uh, standpoint and an R&D standpoint. You need to have enough technical expertise that you are a sophisticated consumer. You can actually understand and peel back, look under the hood and say, yeah, they say they, they're doing this, but they actually haven't solved some of the key problems yet. So being a sophisticated consumer, those are all the pieces of that. And then, of course, taking a look at where those gaps are and defining what are the tech investments we have to make to jump from state of the art today to a capability in a warfighter's hands. And finally, to stay close to the uh, warfighter and operational innovators. So operational inno innovation is, uh, a, I mean, it is many times the key to going forward. Uh, when I was an astronaut, we um, were building the space station on my third mission, and uh, we broke the solar array. We tore it as we were deploying it. Now, there was absolutely no engineering plan around this because it was completely electrified all the time. We didn't want to send a spacewalker out anywhere near that thing. But we had five days to solve the problem or jettison the solar array and put the future of the space station at risk. So I'll tell a story maybe in full some other time, but I can say that in partnership with the ground and the crew, uh, we defined operational innovation and came up with a way to repair the space station so that it could continue. There are amazing things that happen every day in the field. Your warfighters are working around operational problems, and they show the way. They show the path for you. So find every opportunity that you can to actually go out and see the way they do business. Sometimes they don't even know the crazy workarounds they're doing have technology solutions, and that's where you can come in and save the day. So I just want to uh, finish up by saying that um, I'm very proud to be living in Australia this year and helping out. Um, mateship is uh, a very important value uh, that I think that we share. Um, incredible partnerships in technology and in defense and national security between the U.S. and Australia. And I'm really proud, proud to play a part in that and to be here today. Uh, I gave a, a few minutes at the end just in case anybody had any questions, if that's okay, Alex. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what do you think is the, uh, the might not repeat the question so, so we can yeah, hear it, sure. uh, but uh, the streaming, Australia's uh, opportunity in space, I uh, know you're coming into the, yeah. uh, so we're not NASA, we're completely different scale here, <coughs> what's the opportunity and how do you think it's going to play back into the defense national security? <laughs> Uh, so the question came from Dr. Zielinski, what is the unique opportunity that Australia has in space? Uh, what's the future going forward? Um, how should that look? And uh, you're correct to point out that the Australian Space Agency is not NASA. Um, I've heard some people say, sort of get a little deflated about that. They're all excited, ready to, uh, to get out there and go. But the truth is, um, NASA is an amazing organization with uh, fantastic uh, capabilities and also a fantastic budget. And uh, I think what's happening now is there's a transformative change happening in space, particularly around commercial. I should share that um, the reason that I was hired to come in at NASA was to help uh, the defense innovation portfolio think about how they could work with commercial space. That was why I was hired to come in, because previously I had been working with commercial space at the regulator at the FAA and, and had a pretty uh, broad view of, of the industry. Um, we have some really big problems. Space has been the domain of nations, and that means that our laws and our policies and our business practices are set up around governments, including the infrastructure. And so what happens is when commercial comes along and takes the many government investments in space technology and they're trying to commercialize them, oftentimes they have great difficulty operating in that environment. People don't really know how to solve that problem. So it's incredibly important that uh, there is a single voice inside the government for commercial space that can um, communicate with other parts of the government that can work together to try to solve some of those policy problems. I have to say Australia has a huge advantage in this area because you're not limited by baggage 
from space 1.0. So I know that sounds weird, but you can have leapfrog not just in technology but in policy as well. So I think there's a remarkable opportunity for Australia to be nimble and structure themselves around how to support a space economy. The other point, and you, you guys will probably really resonate with this, I've made the point over and over, the relationship between DST, CSIRO, other government organizations also, but in particular those two, the ADF overall and the space agency is really important. Not that someone's going to tell everyone how to spend their money, that's not the point, but having a robust communication structure uh, being, being able to talk about things, know what the needs of the ADF are. So here's the nightmare scenario. The nightmare scenario is that the Australian Space Agency encourages the development of companies that ADF has no interest in funding. Now, it's the, ADF is the biggest customer of space in Australia. Uh, that would be a tragedy. So I think that having that, that communication flow is going to be very important. Thanks for asking, Alex. I think that's really important. Yes? Hi, Pat. Jeremy from Clearbox Systems. I was wondering if you could offer some reflections from your time at DARPA and how you partnered with industry at that time compared to what you're observing with how the ASD partners with industry. Ah, so the question was, um, comparing and contrasting how DARPA worked with industry, industry to DST. I would never pr pretend to be an expert on DST. It's a large organization. And I think um, what I also found at DARPA was that there were, by definition, in different industries, very different partnership agreements. For example, biotech, 100% um, commercial, really very few government transitions, almost in, in uh, chip scale. Uh, things, nanotech, it was almost all transition to industry and then let industry sell it to the government. Um, very different when you're talking about a prototype aircraft that might turn into, or a missile that could turn into a program of record. So the, the uh, reason why DARPA is organized the way that it is by technology area is simply to um, have that expertise in what the best way to work with industry for that technology is. And I think that's probably the key. I'm going to go back to that word sophisticated. We need to be sophisticated. We need to understand the entire business landscape as well as the warfighter landscape. And say, okay, what is the most efficient way to get this amazing technology that we're developing across to the other side? So there's all kinds of bad business outcomes, both for industry and for government, if you don't think through the business case as well. So I would just say, um, rather than trying to compare and contrast, just encourage you to add that, as, a, as technologists, add that sophistication to your portfolio. I mean, industry has to make money. You know, they have, their business case has to close. Uh, and so if IP is a critical part of that, then you have to be flexible in how you do that. All right. Well, I think um, my time is up. Thank you so much. Well, hang on. One more moment. Oh. One more moment. Uh, Pam. On behalf of uh, Alex Zelinski, I would like to give you this token, but I know how much these mean to you, so yes. I thought I'll do it the I'll operator it the way. Operator. So thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.